interpretive key to Gary Will's uh, preposterous book on the priesthood. It's called Why Priests, A Failed Tradition. But the interpretive key, I think, is found in the second chapter, which is a memoir of Gary Wills' Catholic boyhood in the 1940s and 50s. He recalls a time when lay people were, you know, refused access to the chalice, when young uh, Catholic grade school kids worried about what happens to the host when it reaches their intestines, uh, when priests were cosseted and pampered and wore berettas and fiddleback vestments and maniples, when young Catholic girls pinned uh, tissue paper to their hair so they would, would keep their heads covered, when priests were um, uh, deferred to in all social situations, they were, they were seated uh, place on the first tee at golf courses. Well, here's the thing on that chapter. I'm 53 years old. I've been a priest for 27 years. And the only contact I have with that world is from uh, Bing Crosby movies and maybe John Powers' uh, novels. The, the world of this sort of hyper-clericalized uh, Catholicism that Gary Wills uh, complains about has long ago um, even est. And yet, there he is still railing against it. And I think what's going on in this book is largely a sustained polemic against this um, largely disappeared world. For Gary Wills, priests have been a problem uh, from the get-go. He imagines Jesus exclusively as a prophet. He's a prophet in the Hebrew tradition who was opposed by the Jewish establishment, by the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But when these relatively ineffective uh, opponents of Jesus really wanted to get rid of him, they turned, a bit like Don Corleone turning to Luca Brasi, they turned to priests, whom he calls, the chapter heading is, killer priests. Listen to the, here's the quote from page 80 of his book. The priests kill Jesus. That's what they do. They kill the prophets. Uh, I suppose it had nothing to do with Pontius Pilate, with the Roman cohort, with the Sanhedrin, with Judas, etc. It was just those killer priests that did it. And I think he sees the descendants of those killer priests in the mid-20th century America, in this uh, clericalized church. But see, this bizarre association, priests as, as killers of Jesus, leads Gary Wills down all sorts of weird interpretive uh, paths. At the very heart of his book is an analysis of the letter to the Hebrews, which, of course, a key text in the New Testament, a text that's found its way very deeply into the liturgical and spiritual uh, tradition of the church. The uh, unknown author of that text, call it a treatise or a sermon or an exhortation, um, famously uses all the language of uh, cult and temple and priesthood and sacrifice to talk about the significance of Jesus and his death on the cross. So Jesus' death is now construed as the definitive sacrifice to the Lord, the shedding of the blood, which goes beyond the shedding of the blood of animals, etc. Jesus lifting the old dispensation up into a higher and definitive context. That's the, the fundamental argument of the letter to the Hebrews. As I say, a, a letter written maybe around the year 80 in the first century, um, coming up out of an established Christian tradition, accepted by uh, Christian theologians of great weight and importance from the beginning. But Gary Wills is forced to construe this as some, oh, kind of strange and anomalous text, very much here in the tradition of uh, Martin Luther, who wanted to get rid of the letter of James, because the letter of James ran uh, against Luther's view on justification, so just get rid of it. Now, Gary Wills wants to say, get rid of the letter to the Hebrews, because it's anomalous, it's egregious, no other part of the New Testament talks about Jesus in this priestly way. Of course, this is patently absurd. The letter to the Hebrews brings it to very clear and explicit expression, but I would argue that temple and priesthood and sacrifice language runs right through the New Testament, Matthew through Revelation. Just to give a couple of examples, think of the Gospel of Luke, which begins and ends in the temple that is filled with temple imagery and symbolism. At the climax of Luke's Gospel, we have Jesus gathering with his 12 disciples, the 12 tribes of Israel, and now he gives his death a perfectly sacrificial interpretation when he says, this is my body given up for you this is the cup of my blood, which will be shed for you. All of that, of course, is the language of temple sacrifice. More to it, as the disciples take this cup of Jesus' blood, and no first century Jew would have missed this, 
They are in the role of priests. Because when someone came to the temple to sacrifice, the person would cut the throat of the animal and then a priest would catch the blood in a bowl, in a cup. And so implicitly in this text, Jesus is giving his death a sacrificial interpretation and the apostles are acting very much as priests. Look now, in all four Gospels, a key player is John the Baptist, identified as a son of a priest, someone who would have grown up around the temple and sacrifice. What's he doing out in the desert but a priestly ministry, giving people a sort of mikvah bath, that was the bath of purification before you could enter the temple to do sacrifice. He also offered the forgiveness of sins, which of course is what someone received after they had sacrificed in the temple. In John's Gospel, moreover, John the Baptist, this very priestly temple figure, looks at Jesus and says, Behold, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Again, no first century Jew would have missed that's highly charged temple, priesthood, sacrificial language. And see, in John's reading, it happens right at the beginning of the Gospel. It provides the hermeneutical or interpretive key for all of uh, Jesus. It's how we understand who he is. Think, too, in the Gospel of John. Jesus um, sits down for the meal just at the time when the lambs are being sacrificed in preparation for um, Passover. And so the temple association is extremely strong. Look now in Matthew's Gospel. As Jesus dies on the cross, we hear that the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Well, see, what was that? That was the curtain that separated the main body of the temple from the Holy of Holies. On the Feast of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Yom Kippur, the high priest, having made sacrifice in the Holy of Holies, would pass through that veil would come out to the people and then sprinkle them with the blood, symbolizing the fact that the great sacrifice has now effected a reconciliation between Yahweh and his people. Again, nobody in a Jewish context in the first century would have missed. As Jesus dies on the cross, shedding his blood, the curtain is torn in two because he is now the definitive high priest, having made the sacrifice, who now comes out and sheds his blood on all the people. The point is, all of these are richly, densely textured, sacrificial temple priesthood uh, images. The letter to the Hebrews we see now is by no means egregious or anomalous, but rather it's the moment when all of this comes together and comes to explicit expression. It's not the black sheep of New Testament texts. In fact, in some ways, and the tradition recognizes from the beginning, it's a great summarizing and gathering text. It gives a very pointed expression to what is uh, implicitly expressed throughout the New Testament. You know, I might mention too, the book of Revelation, which closes the New Testament, the whole Bible, is filled with temple imagery. The visionary sees in this great uh, manifestation, he sees the heavenly temple with the Ark of the Covenant. A whole liturgy is unfolding. And then who appears at the heart of it but the Lamb standing as though slain. Who is that but the Lamb of God, who by being slain takes away the sins of the world? Temple, priesthood, sacrifice, from Matthew to Revelation, gathered by the letter of the Hebrews, seems to me is a much more accurate way to describe what's going on than this game that Gary Wills is playing. Here's another theme now, and again, born, I think, of this very um, irrational hatred for, for priesthood, is uh, his take on the real presence. So Gary Wills tends to see the doctrine of the real presence as this much later sort of medieval uh, accretion, having nothing to do with the early texts of Christianity, nothing to do with the uh, New Testament, uh, nothing to do with the great church fathers, but this later addition. And see, once that came into play, he argues, priests took on enormous significance because the priests could affect, through transubstantiation, the real uh, presence of Jesus. Well, this is so much nonsense. Yes, indeed, Thomas Aquinas' doctrine of transubstantiation represents a sort of refinement of language, borrowing from philosophical sources unavailable to um, more ancient authors. But it by no means represents a betrayal of the church uh, fathers. Let me give you just a couple of examples. I could have chosen many, many more. Um, look, for example, at um, St. Irenaeus, one of my great heroes. From the 2nd century, he's writing, let's say, around the year 180, 185, he says this, 
The bread which comes from the earth, having received the invocation of God, is no longer ordinary bread, but the Eucharist consisting of two realities, heavenly and earthly. Now, if that ain't the real presence, then, you know, I'm the emperor of China. Uh, Origen of Alexandria, writing in the third century, says this, that Christians rightly reverence every crumb of the consecrated bread. If the consecrated bread is just some kind of vague symbol of of the mystical body, why would you bother reverencing every crumb of it? And then from Gary Wills' hero, so he claims that St. Augustine is the one who sums up his position best. Here's St. Here's Augustine on this issue. That bread which you see on the altar, having been sanctified by the Word of God, just the point Irenaeus made, is the body of Christ. Again, Thomas represents a certain refinement of these views, but that it somehow is a betrayal of the patristic uh, consensus, I just think is, uh, is beyond absurd. I've been holding, in the course of this video, this book in my hand by uh, Henri de Lubac. Gary Wills dedicates his book to Henri de Lubac, who wrote this book called Corpus Mysticum, The Mystical Body. Wills' I think <laughs> preposterous claim is that somehow Henri de Lubac represents his position, that real presence uh, is, is this sort of medieval uh, hang-up, and what the Eucharist is really about is that we are together the body of Christ. Instead, what he's arguing, it seems to me, is for a richer and more complete understanding of the mystical body, which includes, yes, Eucharistic realism and this grander sense of the mystical body. I think it's much closer to what he's saying. And let me offer in support of that this uh, quote from the conclusion of the book. Eucharistic realism and ecclesial realism, these two realisms support one another. Each is the guarantee of the other. Ecclesial realism safeguards Eucharistic realism, and the latter confirms the former. The same unity of the word is reflected in both. Mind you, it's very interesting there. Both Irenaeus and Augustine, Thomas would agree. How does the real presence happen? By the power of the word. It's precisely through the invocation of Jesus' words. The Council of Trent, by the way, confirms that when it says, vi verborum, by the power of the words, the real presence is affected. That's the classical teaching of the church from Irenaeus all the way through Vatican II. Listen to this now. I'm going on with the Lubach. Today, it's above all our faith in the real presence, made explicit thanks to centuries of controversy and analysis, that introduces us to faith in the ecclesial body. Good. That's Vatican II. What Vatican II picked up was exactly that. Yes, the broader sense of mystical body is informed by and made possible by a keen sense of the real presence. So, I mean, I think it's absurd that Gary Wills dedicates his book to Henri de Lubac, who argues, seems to me, in a very different uh, direction. Let me just make a couple of uh, points by way of conclusion. The uh, ministerial priesthood, according to Catholic theology, is deeply connected to the priesthood of Jesus. And what's the priesthood of Jesus? It's the coming together in the singularity of his person of the two natures, divine and human. Priesthood is a mediating or reconciling act, right? And that goes way back to the Old Testament. In his person, Jesus reconciles divinity and humanity. My priesthood, as a, as a priest of the Catholic Church, is a participation in that high priesthood of Jesus. That's why a denial of the divinity of Jesus would indeed lead to a denial of the importance of the priesthood. Ah, now listen to how Gary Wills ends his book. It's from page 259, the last page of the book. Let me simply say this. He's summing up his belief. There's one God, and Jesus is one of his prophets, and I'm one of his millions of followers. Well, first of all, <laughs> it seems to me it makes Gary Wills fundamentally uh, uh, identical to a Muslim who might say there's one God, Allah, and Jesus is one of his prophets. You know, But see, that's quite right. If Jesus is nothing more than one of God's prophets, if he's not truly divine, then indeed the priesthood, as Catholic theology understands it, um, even esses. But, but, if Jesus is who he says he is, who the church has claimed him to be over the centuries, then the priesthood and sacrifice and real presence in Eucharist remain as indispensable as ever.